Hi, I'm Patrick Lowe, Canadian Film Geek Esquire. You'd think that when a movie wins the top award in its home country that it'll be remembered fondly in the years that follow. However, in Canada, the rules run differently as to how we honor our national cinema. And so it was, in 1973, that the annual Canadian Film Awards, led by an international jury, decided to award Best Picture and Best Director to first-time filmmaker David Okoma for his debut feature, Slipstream. The press and the critics were outraged. The film had clearly bested superior efforts, including Peter Pearson's Paperback Hero and Don Shabib's Best 70s film, Between Friends. This decision resulted in a scandal that saw the cancellation of the awards ceremony the following year and led the Globe and Mail to award the CFA a special Grand Prix for general all-around stupidity. Needless to say, Slipstream was a failure at the box office, garnered mainly negative reviews, and was generally forgotten in the years that followed, although it was released on home video in the mid-80s. Which is too bad, because for all its flaws, Slipstream has a lot to offer, including some stellar visuals, a killer rock soundtrack, and a 70s zeitgeist that made the film fun, if quaint, to watch. Set on the rolling plains of Lethbridge, Alberta, the film opens with the image of Mike Mallard, a reclusive FM disc jockey trying to lasso an airplane on horseback. When he is followed by a band of hippies, they discover his home base, a rundown farm which conceals Mallard's secret radio studio. Hey, what a great setup. Hey, Annie, check out this hardware. What is all this stuff? You're Mike Mallard. The guy on the radio? Wow. Out here? Now look, I don't know how much you people know about the show or about me. Well, nobody knows nothing about That's you. That's the way it's supposed to be. Well, how come you're hiding anyway? It's not hiding, it's a gimmick. We keep it a secret for obvious reasons. Are we the only people who know? It's the way it's got to be. He lives in seclusion as part of the mystique, and he attracts one of the hippies, Kathy, played by Patty Oatman. God damn it, can't you see I'm on the air? Really What's with you people? You think you can walk in on anybody, anytime, any place? And you can. Where's the rest of them? Blue jeans. B L U E. I'm alone. Guys and gals who Do you mind? Cool As she winds up getting involved with him, Mallard finds himself up against his own boss, a corporate bigwig played by Ellie Rill, who wants him to play more commercial music to his liking. I asked you to play the Ronnie McClare LP last night. I did. You did not. Before the show, it was so bad, all he's done is copy everybody else. Certain people think he has a good commercial potential to make a lot of... Anybody that's really into rock can smell him a mile away. Uh, most people are not into rock that heavy. They listen to your show because it's the thing to do. People buy what they're heavily exposed to, what they're told to. You come by the office someday, and I'll show you all those strange little charts and things, and then you'll see where your people are. Patty and Mike enjoy in some fun, riding horseback in the nude, and dancing to Layla during an exciting prairie storm. But then fun and games are over when Patty starts to feel neglected by Mike, and a breakup ensues. I didn't think you were coming back. You shouldn't have done it, baby. I had a lot of things I wanted to get straight last night. I made a mistake. Somehow I thought we were important. I was wrong. Obviously, the program is the only thing you have on a meaningful level. I'm sorry. All right, you had your say. Now, let's go back. I'm tired. Drop it. I tried to tell you last night, remember? What are you getting at? Who do you think you are that you can turn people on and off whenever you feel like it? I'm not just another switch that's going to respond every time you push it. Inspired by this, Mike rebels against his boss by trying to do a show to reflect his own thoughts on the music industry. Of course, the artist didn't get much, you didn't get much. But the record company, oh yeah, we have a little corruption in the music business. Just about everywhere you look. We're all getting hustled by the promoters. The artist, the jobber, you. However, his boss cuts the show and later fires him, 
inspiring Mike to rebel again in his own particular way. What'd you come for? Oh, you know what I'm doing here, Michael. Well, I thought I made a few things perfectly clear last night, got a lot off my chest. I feel great today, like I took a good crap. And I didn't hear your show last night. Nobody did. You were cut off. <laughs> Michael, you... Did you really think that we were just gonna sit around and let you keep on saying whatever came to your head? All this insightful information about the record business, from the job rackers to the artiste. That's very touching. And so, you know, I don't really know how to do the interview, but I thought, well, I could just watch you do your show, because uh, I never really watched that DJ work, and... <laughs> what are you doing? What's that, man? It smells like gasoline. Although the film is competently written and directed, its biggest drawback is the lead performance of Luke Askew as Mike Mallard, whose previous claim to fame was playing a hippie on Easy Rider. Though he looks and sounds the part, Askew is too unlikable a character to develop any audience sympathy for whatever he does. He seems to be at odds with everyone, including his fans and the one woman who loves him, and he has no consistent philosophy towards his music, and his views can best be described in this one scene. Crap. More crap. All crap. So far from being a voice of freedom on the airwaves, Mallard comes across less as an anti-hero and more like an obnoxious a-hole with a chip on his shoulder waiting to be knocked off. <laughs> in fact, a lot of what he does in the film doesn't really make sense. Hello to everybody out there who really cares. This is Mike Mallard out here. Is there anyone out there? What makes the movie memorable are its first-rate visuals and its lush soundtrack. Thanks to Mark Champion, one of Canada's most underrated directors of photography, the movie looks amazing. With its rolling prairie vistas, the amazing compositions of Cloud and Sky, and the luminous lighting throughout, especially during the rainstorm dance and the burning of the studio. And it sounds good, too, with the music of Layla and Astro Weeks combined with an omniscient and ambient sound design that pulsates through the picture like electricity. In fact, it's fair to say that the look and sound of the picture belongs to a much better movie, and it's unfortunate that Akoma didn't push the scripts and actors as much as he did with the film itself. But then some features, even if they were failures, deserve to be seen again, if only to appreciate the virtues that were overlooked by critics and audiences alike at the time. Slipstream remains a remarkable technical and visual accomplishment despite its dramatic drawbacks, and deserves to be better remembered than having just caused a critical brouhaha in 1973. Otherwise, I'm Patrick Lowe, signing off until next flick, Megwitch.